when it comes to you know how the, how the world uh, of finance works for whatever reason that just clicks with me so I, I go deep into the rabbit hole and you know because I come from an engineering background rather than an economics background I like to go down to first principles down to the numbers themselves and then try to reconstruct what's happening rather than kind of taking uh, you know existing models uh, as, as kind of my core uh, foundation. The way that control systems work, if you, th if you think of a thermometer, right? So every time it senses the temperature goes too high, it, it kicks in a, a reaction response and then it, it cools the, the, the air. And every time it goes too cool, it kicks in the opposite response and it heats it up. That's how a lot of macroeconomic systems work. Whenever there's something happening, uh, often policymakers end up putting themselves in the position of the thermometer. So they come in, right. you know, if deflation's happening, they come in with an inflationary response and so all these different kind of uh, feedback loops. And, and so the right. background and control systems kind of goes so well I, with that. So if I could explain why it's Newtonian versus, I mean, uh, it's quantum versus Newtonian. Newtonian, um, New Newton's physics was action and reaction. And quantum physics was the, 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 the bigger picture. What happened if you if you had this reaction or that reaction? What was the temperature? What happened outside of it? Well, the reason, once I understood in 1971 when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, at that time I was flying in Vietnam, and I knew something was going to change. And that's where quantum comes in versus Newtonian. And I wanted to know what the quantum would be. What would be the, the ripple effect? What would the global effect be? So, and the other reason, because I studied history, the best way to kill capitalism is to debauch the currency. So in 71, when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, I went to military school, so I studied military economics. And military economics was very concerned about guys like Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, Mao. And that's who we studied. And then socialist economics is Keynesian, which is you can print as much money as you like. And then capitalist economics, we were taught was Mises Austrian school, hard money, which is where Bitcoin and gold and silver kind of fit in. So after World War One, of course, Germany's production base was destroyed. And whenever you have a country with destruction, uh, productive base kind of uh, damaged, uh, plus they had external war reparations. So they had debts that they couldn't print away. It wasn't denominated in their own currency. And so they eventually experienced a hyperinflation as they basically printed money to, to finance deficits. Uh, and after losing the war, after having all this, you know, very challenging political and financial situation, it more and more kind of uh, uh, populism and extremism uh, build up, and then it took a really dark path. I think that's where hyperinflation set in. And the other, th other word you said in there was reparations. And my concern is, I'm not trying to be racist here, but when the blacks, Americans are trying to get reparations for slavery, that's what happened in 1918 with the Treaty of Versailles was they forced the German people to pay reparations to England and France. And that led to hyperinflation and then the rise of Hitler. So that's kind of, you know, the, as an old guy and then went to military school again, that's what we studied. That's kind of what happened in 71 when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. They could print as much as they liked. It's the same thing that happened after 1918, the Treaty of Versailles. They couldn't pay their bills. Yeah, so my, my long-term phase case uh, for the United States is for a higher inflation, uh, but not necessarily hyperinflation. And because whenever we see cases of hyperinflation, like like Weimar, uh, like some emerging markets, generally you need a combination of a couple of things. One is you need a, a destruction of your productive base. Uh, and so that happened in the Weimar Republic, that happened in Zimbabwe, and that could be the, that can be due to a lost war, or it can be due to uh, really bad internal uh, social policies. Is that, uh, is, that, is, that, is that what's happening in Venezuela today? Yes, exactly. Uh, that's another case of, of hyperinflation happening. And so you have that kind of uh, uh, severe drawdown in the, in the productive base. So they can't make enough goods and services to satisfy their needs. So regardless of how much money they print, it, the prices start going up rapidly. A second thing that helps contribute to hyperinflation is when they owe debt in a currency they can't print. So a lot of emerging markets today, like Argentina, for example, they owe debt that's denominated in dollars. Uh, whereas developed countries like, you know, Japan, and the United States, their debts are mostly denominated in their own currencies. And so uh, those hyperinflationary events tend to have those couple recipes. 
Uh, but for example, you often refer to the 1971 period, and that was a case of, of rapid inflation in the United States, uh, but it didn't, it didn't reach the levels of hyperinflation because we still had our productive base. You know, we didn't have a collapse in our economy. We just had a really sharp devaluation of currency. And so it was something that the currency wasn't completely obliterated. It was just severely damaged. And that's kind of the, the outcome is my uh, a base case, I think, going forward over the next decade, is that you can see it, in developed countries pretty significant uh, currency devaluation. And so it's going to start, I think, in the next uh, you know handful of years. And it's one of those things where at first, when you get some degree of, uh, you know, they call it reflation, like you, you start from like a low period of inflation, you get that kind of higher inflation. Uh, at first, it can feel good to a lot of people. And so, for example, that's what it felt like this year, uh, you know, when, when stimulus checks go out and when you have that kind of rebound. And so next year, if you get a decline in the dollar versus other currencies, if you get inflation that goes up to, you know, the official way they measure it, which, you know, that's a whole other discussion. But if that goes up to two, three percent, you know, in the next, you know, maybe two years, uh, that can feel good at first. And then the, but the problem is, you know, at that point, they're very likely to overshoot. Uh, because you know a lot of their deficits at this point are structural, right? So uh, even just taking out discretionary spending, if you just focus on entitlements and military and, and interest on the debt, that already is pretty much all uh, you know incoming tax receipts. It's exactly as you said. What happened in Germany was it crushed production. We've done everything exactly as uh, the Weimar Republic did: pay reparations. The economy was crushed, production went out, same thing happened in Zimbabwe, same thing in Venezuela. And when I, when in 1971, I'd already graduated from school, I'm flying in Vietnam and Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. And so that's when it twigged me because I had different types of education, different economics from what they teach regular kids. So our, our, our economics in school and business schools today in the US are, are socialist, Keynesian, you can print money. That's not, not what he said, but that's what they interpreted. Yeah. Exactly. And I think one of the key things to watch is the destruction uh, in production of commodities. And so, you know, if you look at a lot of commodity prices, uh, exception of, of gold and silver that have done really well recently, a lot of them are roughly the same price they were 10 or 15 years ago. And that's because we had this period of commodity oversupply. Uh, so, for example, a lot of cheap money allowed us to, to apply new technologies to get more oil and gas out of the ground. We had that period of kind of uh, copper oversupply. And so a lot of those things were in a period of oversupply that feels really abundant. However, you know, because uh, prices have been in that that kind of, uh, you know, they haven't been rising in many cases for several years, uh, you know, that, that incentive to get new production has diminished. And so, for example, this year we saw a very large reduction in, in capital expenditures for new oil and gas fields. Uh, we also, for several years, have been seeing really weak uh, copper development. And of course, copper is a, a really important element for the whole new economy, for you know, grids, uh, electrical grids, infrastructure, all, all these important things, both in the United States and the world. And so because we've had this period of uh, commodity oversupply, some of the inflationary policy has not been very apparent in, in, in everyday uh, life. You know, some areas it has, we've had a lot of inflation in healthcare expenditures, we've had a lot of inflation in tuition, childcare ser services. Uh, but because commodities have, have remained relatively cheap, that hasn't really flowed out yet. Now, I think a key thing to watch is that going forward, some of the supply for these commodities is getting pretty tight. And when that goes up against very large deficits uh, you know, that are in large part being monetized, you can start to see a general rise in commodity prices. And, I, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say that's going to be next year or, or three years from now. But as we go deeper in the 2020s, I do think that's a really look, thing to consider. And that that can promote a much more inflationary trend and some scare and like uh, problems getting the commodities we need.